Thanks, Caroline. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming along today. Uh, so today I'll be talking about my PhD, Genetic and Environmental Factors Affecting the Germination of Eucalyptus globulus blue gum seeds. Um, so I'll be talking about my, my project and my key findings, basically, and just sort of giving you some, some scope of what I did and, and just some of the main things we found out. I thought I'd throw this slide in just for to break the ice. Um, put it up at the start of my uh, very six years ago introductory seminar, so I should have, thought it should come out now again. Um, so basically my project investigated the high temperature response of germinating globular seeds and also like seeding development as well. It had a significant industry focus, uh, working in partnership with Seed Energy, they are my industry partner, and Seed Purity as well. Uh, Supervisors were Al Gracie, Brad Pops, Phil Brown, Cameron Spur. And I'd like to thank them and my industry partner for the financial and in-kind support that Seed Energy provided for my project. Um, I'd like to put a few slides up just for background. So there's been major expansion of the eucalypt plantation estate. Um, I guess the key point here is that Globulus is the most planted eucalypt in industrial plantations in temperate regions of the world. Uh, this, the, the eucalypt plantation estate reached almost a million hectares in 2010 and that's dominated by globulus, over half a million hectares and also nitens. Um, it's estimated there's about 2.3 million hectares worldwide in 2004 and it's likely that would have increased a lot in the last decade, that area. Um, so basically it's grown mainly for pulp wood production, it has excellent pulp properties. Uh, there's also increasing use for veneer and solid wood products. Um, it can offer superior growth rates uh, in plantation forestry. It can also offer land reclamation or ornamental value as well. Um, this slide's important because it sort of gives uh, a bit of context to the project. So deployment for this species is mainly from seeds rather than from clones. They have tried clonal propagation, but there's been low average rooting success for the majority of genotypes, and it's really high cost as well. So it hasn't really been an effective means of deployment. Uh, so most plantations have been established from seedlings um, and this relies on successful seed germination and that's been a problem. Uh, it's been variable and uneven in many nurseries in Australia and uh, other parts of the world I'm sure. Uh, so this, this slide really describes what I'm talking about by slow erratic germination really increasing seedling production costs. So on your left um, is what you'd hope to see in a nursery. So they, they mechanically sow these trays in there with one seed per cell and you'd hope to see that scenario where you've got um, uniform plant size, a uh, good, good number of you know, plants per cell, whereas one on the right is a real disaster. Um, very uneven uh, plants and a lot of empty cells. Uh, that scenario would, would require a lot of regrading and it would really increase the cost. So I'm told that a large nursery might sell up to 40 million seeds in a year and this sort of problem can cause a 25% loss. Um, just due to the regrading and that's a really big cost. Uh, going into this project we, we knew that temperature stress was contributing but this whole PhD was about trying to understand more about that. This is some data from Cameron Spur. Uh, two different temperature cycles fluctuating 28 and 15 and 35 and 15 in the red. You can see what a uh, negative effect that high temperature is having there on both the overall germination and the rate. It's really slow and it's uh, quite reduced overall as well. So that was some background data that we had, um, which was really showing that, that, that high temperature looked important. Uh, we, knew, we know that germination is a complex response and there's many factors involved that are sort of integrating. Uh, seed quality factors such as seed viability, vigour, uh, seed dormancy, genetic quality, uh, then environmental parameters such as temperature, water availability, light, pH, nutrient availability, really complex process. Um, so for this project we had to form some research questions and look to the literature for what, what was the optimum temperature for this species. Uh, International Seed Testing Association gives a, uh, a guide for germinating all different types of seed species of seeds and for globulus it stated 25. Some, a paper from, from Lopez stated 28 degrees and he was sort of st stating that between 15 and 33 was, was okay. Um, but we knew that temperatures in nurseries were often higher than this. We knew temperatures would get up as high as 40. Um, just the location of the nurseries, uh, the sowing time, so they're sowing in, in the summer. Um, and most of these nurseries, I'm told, wouldn't have effective temperature control. So a lot of them would be hectares in size um, and they wouldn't have any air conditioning or means of reducing the temperature. 
So the key question for us was, what effect does this have on, on the germination and the seedling development? Uh, so some more questions. What can we understand about the seed before it goes to the nursery? So what, what can we know about it? Uh, are agronomic factors important? Uh, so that's talking about sort of production uh, factors. This seed, I'll talk more about it later, but it's sort of produced in seed orchards. It's pretty intensively managed, so factors such as when they pick the seed, uh, the way the trees are irrigated, all those sorts of factors is what I'm talking about there. Uh, seed size or seed yield, is, is that important? Um, is it secondary dormancy? What are the cardinal temperatures? So, so the cutoffs for sort of how low or high, how high can it get before we won't get any germination? Uh, is there a genetic component uh, to, the, to the germination and the high temperature response? Is, it, is there like a maternal or paternal influence? So is it like the male, sorry, is it the female or the, or the male parent having an effect? And what effect does the breeding system have? Open pollinated versus uh, mass supplementary pollination or self pollination? I'll explain a bit more about that later. Um, so the scope of my project initially was to try and characterise the response to temperature. So that was both below and above the, the optimum. We wanted to look across a whole range of temperatures and we wanted to try and select temperatures for, for screening work. We knew we couldn't do all the germination at a whole range of temperatures, so we had to pick some that would be good screening ones. Uh, the genetic part of it was pretty large, so trying to understand if there was sort of any genetic regulation at the race or genotype level. Um, and then this agronomic sort of factors I mentioned, like harvesting time, uh, irrigation, kilning temperature. I won't talk about that part of it today, but that was another large part of the work. This slide's pretty important, I think, because it sort of describes uh, what happened at the start. So that's the thermo gradient table at the top. If you look at the early work on that, um, the first problem we encountered was at really high temperature, but we tried germinating in a peach tradition, it just dried out too quickly. So even checking it sort of regularly, like several times a day, it was just drying. Trying to germinate them at 40 degrees was hopeless. So we designed these boxes, you can see here. Um, we got these, we designed them and we got them built by Richard Holmes in the School of Zoology. Uh, so they're a Perstex box, and basically you put the water in the bottom, each is, this, each of these bits of paper's got 50 seeds on it, um, and each has got its own separate well, so that sort of any tannins or anything being released, we wanted to keep separate from the other lots. Um, and the sloping lid was so that uh, the water that evaporated would sort of walk back down the lid into the reservoir. That worked really well. Uh, we sort of check them regularly, like every day, but we were able to to germinate them at a really high temperature. So I think I had a table set at about 50 at the hot end, and I was measuring temperature inside. You can see the probes in the bottom right of your screen. Uh, it's getting, I think the highest I could get was about 42.7, but that was high enough. Um, so that worked really well. And, and then from that, we did all that work in 24 hour light, because that was the only way we could really control the light in that room. It wasn't the other way. So we then did all the other experiments in incubators uh, with the 24 hour light to keep it consistent. So that's sort of an experiment we did, be like 50 seeds on a, on a piece of uh, filter paper there. Some early results. Uh, the picture, the photo at the bottom really explains what I'm talking about. You can see that that's six days after sowing. Um, there's a really dramatic temperature effect. So between sort of 22 and uh, about 28, it's pretty good. good. Good germination, good seeding development. Below and above that, not so much. Um, the table is showing you there's two runs from this early work. So the first one was, was using Globulus 185, that's a commercial seed lot produced by Seed Energy. The second run used four commercial seed lots. Um, they're sort of broad, broad genetic background seed lots, except for King Island, which I think is a fairly narrow genetic base. Um, so we germinated in the first run just the one lot, in the second run the four, and we wanted to see if they varied in their response and try to sort of characterise what was happening. You can see there's two different traits up there, normal seedlings from, sow from sowing and the rate, the T50, that's the time taken to get to 50% of, of what you know, was attained, so that was our rate parameter. Uh, the column for optimum and there's a column for range, I think the range is the temperatures over which it didn't significantly deviate from the optimum, so you can see it varied a bit for different seed lots, but it was fairly consistent, like around 25 was pretty good for most of them. Um, which was fairly consistent with ISTA, but, but some more slides here to show they did differ, the seed lots differed, we think, in their response. So these are snapshots through time, day 7, 14, 21 of the second run. Um, you can see there's pretty dramatic temperature effect. Uh, so at the lower and higher temperatures, much slower germination and overall less, less germination being, being attained. Um, these, these graphs 
basically show the same, tell the same story. Um, the top two are first run, so the single seed lot, and um, the second two are actually with the four seed lots, but they're just showing what a drastic, dramatic effect temperature's having above 40, you're not getting any normal seedlings, um, and the rates slowed down. So a larger number there for T50 means it took more time to get to 50%, so it was slower, essentially, as you can see the fastest ones are around 20, 25 degrees. Um, so from this early work, we decided to go with 25, 32, and 37 degrees for all our um, all the work I'll present from here on. We did at those temperatures based on this this data we got here. Um, so that was really important. Uh, this this slide at the end of a germination test, you classify everything that's left, um, basically squash squash the seeds that remain that haven't germinated, um, and sort of classify them as, as dead. Um, according to the ISTA guidelines, fresh ungerminated is like sort of an intact embryo, um, firm sort of white embryo, but a dead seed is like just dead, it doesn't look good, it's maybe diseased, it, yeah, it's, it's not uh, firm or intact. And abnormal, it started to germinate, it sort of started to develop, but it's not considered normal. Um, that photo there is what a normal seedling should look like at 25, you've got some cotyledons, a radical, hypocotyl, it's a normal seedling. Um, the key point here with these graphs is that at the high temperature end, you can see there's more of the black. Generally, there's more of the black bit, which is the abnormal seedlings, and, the, and there's more dead seeds. So we, we're trying to argue here that there's, there's, the high temperature had killed the seeds, but we had more mortality, whereas lower temperature was like more fresh ungerminated, so it was almost like dormancy. It didn't seem to be killing them. Um, that picture really describes what's going on, though. You can see of the ones that did germinate and even start to develop at high temperature, they were really stunted and looking very different to a one germinated and developed at 25. That work's been published um, in Seed Science and Technology. This slide is just to, to give you some indication of how I did my experiments. So I worked in a seed orchard from one of Seed Energy's seed orchards at Cambridge. That's the orchard there. Um, so in the late 1980s, the CSIRO did collections from the range wide where globulus grows, basically the geographic range. Um, and these would be selections from those, those original collections, um, selected maternal genotypes. Um, so I pick the capsules off the trees. Uh, you can see they're putting them in a bag and then bringing them back to the lab. I kilned them all, except for the kilning experiment, I kilned them all at 40 degrees for 24 hours, which is what the industry practice is for extracting the seeds. You can see how the seeds look coming out of the um, capsules, they've got a lot of other material, chaff and impurities, so that had to be cleaned um, to 100% purity to do my germination test, that was a big job. Uh, and then these little cups here, I've got 50 seeds in each one and then poured them onto those bits of paper and spent about three years pick counting them as they germinated. Uh, that was a big job. Um, oh, when I picked the trees, I there's the literature saying that the outcrossing rate varies in the height of the canopy, so there can be more inbreeding at the bottom and more outcrossing at the top, so I divided each tree into four sections, uh, up and down, east and west if you like, so to keep it consistent between the trees, trying to, to not bias it either way, and, and, and there's lots of things that went on with the harvesting, but, but that's just a bit of a snapshot. This is just to show you work from Dukowski and Potts, where the uh, species has been classified into races and sub-races, so for my genetic work, I selected trees from the Western Otways, the top left, um, Streslecki Ranges and Ferno, trees from that genotypes from those races in the Cambridge Seed Orchard. That's just to explain a bit about how this orchard's set up, what these genotypes mean, they're from those races. <coughs> so this is, I want to talk a bit about this, this study because it was a big part of my project. Um, a lot of studies confound maternal genetics and maternal environment um, because they don't have randomised sort of maternal genotypes or maternal trees, but we, we did have that in this orchard, so we were actually able to sample from multiple, about four trees for each genotype, which, which gave us more power pulling apart these genetic and environment effects. Uh, we ran this work over two seasons and two sites, so Cambridge, as I mentioned, and Manjima in Western Australia, um, and that allowed us to do this genetic, and to look at the genetic and maternal environment regulation of the seed germination responses. Uh, so with my experiments, I talked earlier about the work we did. Um, after that, we did the work in incubators. I scored for germination, radical emergence, and seedling development as well, so normal seedlings. And, and from that data, we in SAS, we were able to get six traits, which all the statistics has been based around these six traits. So 
proportion germination, the proportion of seedlings developed, um, the proportion of germinated seeds which went on to develop into normal seedlings, the rate of T50 of germination and seedling development, and then the rate of development from germination into a seedling. They're the traits that all the, all the tables or graphs I put up relate to those traits. Um, so this is what we found out with the genetic component of the work. Maternal genetics and the maternal environment being cycle season indeed affected the germination response. Um, it was really highlighted the complexities of the germination response. It was a pretty complex data set. Uh, and it sort of showed us we need to have seed lock specific testing because these things are going to vary between seed lots. Uh, so that table, it's a bit blacked out at the top. They're the six traits I described across the top, three proportion and three rate traits. The key point here is where the arrows are. They're the, they're the, the genotype by temperature interaction. So they're, they're the traits. Three, only three out of 18 tests were we able to show that they actually responded differentially to temperature. But interestingly, like we got a lot of significant genotype effects. So the maternal genotype looked to be really important, but only in a few cases did it actually affect the way they respond to high temperature. Um, we also tested this like to a race level. I mentioned there were three races. So they were the Ferno, West Knot, and Streslaki. Only in it, for rate of seeding development could we really attribute it to race. Those graphs aren't a significant interaction, but there is a significant race effect. So it's the triangle, the Streslaki race is faster um, in, its, in its seeding development, but we couldn't actually attribute much of it to race, to, to a race level. This graph is the seven, so it was 17 genotypes. That's just showing how differently they responded to temperature, so that's significant uh, interaction there. You can see it's very different. Some of them are you know, relatively tolerant, others are crashing down at 37 that, and really falling over in terms of the germination from sowing. Uh, so that was a really interesting result to get, and we've got this work in Annals of Forest Science at the moment. This is more, more data from that work. Um, so I mentioned that season and site can affect affect things, well that's a significant season interaction showing that that the response to temperature actually changed with season. Um, but with side, it was at the, it, it, it's, with season it was at the higher temperature end, they, they changed, so D and E being different, um, whereas in the next graph you can see it's at the, actually at the optimum temperature they were different, they actually, the sites differed only at optimum, so it was really quite interesting, but it was really complex. Um, that bottom graph's averaged across all the temperatures just looking at the genotypes um, the two seasons, you, and you can see that overall they're changing quite a bit depending on the season, so it was really quite complex what was going on. This slide is just to show you that some of the data was correlating well between 25 and 37, only that rate data, so rate of seeding development or rate of germination, the other traits not so much. So that's sort of arguing that we could potentially use some of the data at 25 to predict what might happen at, at high temperature, but really only in those particular traits, not so much in the others, it didn't correlate so well. This was a separate part of the project where we looked at the paternal and maternal effects. Um, there's not many studies that look at, look at the paternal parent, um, especially not in, I think in forest, forest tree species, so it's quite unique to do this. But we, we basically did a dialogue crossing where we, we, we selected four genotypes from one, one race. We had two trees from, from each one in different plots in the seed orchard. And then we did reciprocal crossing, so we crossed in each, each every different combination except for self pollination, and we were able to look at the look at them as males or female parents. Uh, this slide is just to explain a little bit about how we did the, how I did the crossing. So you select flowers that look like the top left; they haven't shed the operculum yet. You, have, you know they haven't been contaminated with any other pollen. You then cut off the male parts of the of the flower, so emasculation, um, and then cut the stigma. Actually, put the pollen on the cut style. Um, and then isolate with these balloons and tag the branch, leave it for a year while the seed develops and then come back and harvest. That's different from the mass supplementary pollination which is a technique they use commercially to, to pollinate globulus where they don't do the ice, they don't do the emasculation and the isolation, they simply cut the, the style, put the pollen on and then leave it. So it's much lower cost, more, less labour intensive, but this is more controlled. So I think in mass supplementary pollination you get 87% no, of, of the cross is what you want it to be, and it's about four percent selfing and a small amount of outcrossing. With this, it should be completely controlled. Uh, this is what we found from this work. We found that indeed both the paternal and and maternal parents affected the germination response, which is really interesting. 
um, this argued for at least some influence of the nuclear genotype of the embryo. The most importantly, I guess, to come out of it was that we found the maternal parent was really the one that controlled its response to high temperature, that the male parent didn't have such an effect there. But the, the, the maternal parent was really important for that. I know this slide's pretty tedious, but the red arrow is basically the top of that graph, the top of the table, sorry, is the, the female and male genotype effects. You can see they're both having an effect, significant for many traits. But looking down towards the bottom of the table, it's really important where it's the interactions of female genotype or, or male genotype of temperature. And the male one, there's no significant interactions there, but for the female, there is for quite a few traits. So it actually separates out depending. Uh, which parent, it's the, it's the female one that's affecting the response to high temperature, which was a really key finding here. Those graphs are just highlighting that for some of the traits for, where we got the significant interactions. Um, and you can see it's, it's changing the way they respond to high temperature stress for those traits. We published this work in Annals of Bioscience. Uh, this slide is just showing you the, I said the male and the female parent could affect the germination uh, for some traits but it wasn't a significant interaction for the male. So that's just showing you, that's averaged across all the temperatures. You can see that you know, there's a lot of cases where the male parent was important, but it's only when you averaged across the temperatures. Um, it's not, it's not for that specifically for that high temperature uh, response. Uh, we also looked at self-pollination versus open pollination. Open pollination is just being pollinated by the surrounding trees in the orchard, not controlling it at all, versus the MSP, which I described. We selected one genotype from the Otway race for this study. We select all the trees in that orchard have been mapped for self incompatibility, um, and we chose the most self compatible so that we could hopefully get some success in our, in our self pollinations. Uh, so we, we chose five trees and we performed the three crosses, and then we went back a year later and collected the seed. And we found that the self pollination negatively affected the germination traits. There was also indication of increased sensitivity high temperature stress from selfing. That was really interesting because in this species there's a lot of literature suggesting inbreeding depression, but not very much so early on. Um, so this is sort of, you know, in the first 14, 21 days of, of growth that's actually having a negative effect. So that was quite interesting. Um, just some notes on statistical analysis. We did some general linear models. David Rakowski helped a lot uh, to build models analysing it in that way. Brad Potts gave me a tremendous amount of help running mixed models in SAS, uh, which is what we ended up using in the thesis, and all the data I presented today was from that analysis. We also looked at Bayesian analysis with Ross Corbett, <coughs> and he fitted some models to the data, um, fitting curves to the germination profiles, and also he looked at the genetic data set, and he's still working on it, um, building, building some models that, that have worked quite well to fit, fit curves to the data. Uh, so I'd like to sum up with these slides. Uh, with the temperature responses, a key point is that above 30 degrees we had we encountered problems. So that's slower germination, slower seeding development, and reduced um, overall germination and indeed reduced <coughs> number of seedings attained. At low temperature we had slower germination, slower seeding development, <coughs> but, but less seed mortality. So we, we did we didn't think low temperature was the problem in the nurseries, but it's interesting to show that, that that was the case. I mean, in the literature, it suggests that low temperature slows the water uptake, slows imbibition, um, whereas high temperature most likely would be doing physiological damage, so maybe damaging the uh, cell membranes or internal structures of the seed, and it's sort of irreparable. Uh, the optimum temperatures we found to be between 24.8 and 25.5 and for rate of normal seed development, but for the maximum number, we found it was between 21.2 and 24.8, so pretty close with what the ISTA recommends, a bit lower than what Lopez stated. Uh, but his work was done on a fairly narrow genetic based seed lot. Uh, we found the cardinal temperatures, so the cutoffs, were between 9.1 and 10.5 at low temperature, and between 40.3 and 41.4 at the upper end. So outside of those ranges, you won't, we, we argue you won't get any seed development at all. They're basically the cutoffs, we get an arm enough goes higher than that or lower at that end. Another key point was that seed lofts can exhibit a differential response to temperature, so that was really important. Um, we showed that with the early work with the commercial seed lots, um, they, they don't all respond the same. And that for some of the traits, the rate of seeding development, maybe not the others so much, it didn't look as good, but there was some correlation. We may be able to use 
the difference is at 25 for prediction of what might happen at 37 for argument's sake, um, but not for all trades. The genetic work, the real key points are that the maternal, geni maternal genotype had a significant effect. Um, both the maternal and paternal parents affected the germination response, but it was really the <coughs> maternal parent which was um, uh, influencing the response to high temperature stress, causing that differential response to the, the paternal parent not so much, or it didn't have any significance in terms of how they responded to high temperature, but it did still have an effect when you average the data across temperatures. And there's just this point about genetic interaction with environment and or harvesting factors, that's a really important point. Um, the harvesting factors are complex, I haven't talked about them today, but things like the harvesting time, we found that was important. So the time elapsed from flowering, when you actually pick the fruit, um, and things like the irrigation and the, all those things are important too. Um, so the outcomes from this project have got significant industry application. Uh, <coughs> I think the project highlights the fact there's a need to try and account for all these things such as tree genetics, maternal environment, these harvesting factors such as the seed harvest site, the season, the age of the seed when it's harvested. There's a lot of things to take into account uh, to try and understand what's going on with the seed germination. Uh, I guess screening prior to deployment to nurseries is going to be important. Um, any screening that can be done to try and understand the response will be good. This is what we've derived so far from the project and our publications. Uh, so we've got a few, hopefully we'll get maybe one or two more. Thanks. I guess, uh, well, keep the, potentially keep the seed lot separate. So don't, I mean, the gen, even at the, the genotype level, we found some of the genotypes were really sensitive, so don't mix them with the, the more tolerant ones. Uh, no real, you know, there's no simple answer, I don't think, to give to a nursery manager in terms of how to manage it. If, if it was simple, like we could just say to control the temperature, sort of keep it at 25, but as far as I understand it, that wouldn't be a solution, really. Most of these nurseries wouldn't have uh, the means to do that. So I guess keeping the keeping the genetics, the, the seed lot separate would be a good start to try to manage it. But in the nursery situation, what you described was, it makes sense, is that it's occasional high temperatures in an uncontrolled external environment that's the problem, but you didn't seem to look at thermal shock at all in terms of, you looked at constant temperatures, but did you look at you know, occasional very high temperatures? Yeah, that's a fair that's point. No, we didn't. We didn't do that. We we did all our work. Well, we, we kept the temperatures constant. So I mean, yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty hard it's a pretty high stress to be under that all the time. But I'm sure there'd be merit in doing that. You know, working looking at work where you just yeah give it a shock for a short time. But with this particular project, we designed experience like that, having the constant stress. So yeah, I'm sure that's a good point. Um, we had a lot of problems with humidity, like doing the experience in those boxes. We ended up putting a container, like have, we, we, we put a container of water in the incubator to try to make the environment in the incubator more humid because in the boxes it was just getting so humid, we're having a lot of pathogens and disease, it was a real problem. It was very difficult actually to, to, to germinate them at 37 degrees because you know, you've got all that water in the bottom of the box and it was just becoming so humid that it was having a real effect. Just, I mean, there'd be pathogens on the seed from, from harvesting or from anywhere and that was just just yeah going just growing way too much and affecting things at high temperature so we, we, we managed it by putting a container of you know just an open ice cream container of water in the incubator and that seemed to help but it was an issue it was really difficult to to keep it as you know you couldn't keep it a sterile environment it was an issue for sure yeah I was just going to say uh, Karen do you um, have you followed through and, and um, found out if veterinary nursery managers have actually changed what they do because of access to your results? I don't think there's too many nurseries in Australia at the moment sowing eucalypt, unfortunately, mm -hmm. so I haven't. Um, but I'm 
I would be I would really like to do that and to, to visit some nurseries mm -hmm. um, and potentially overseas maybe yeah. do some work you know um, consultancy or yeah. or just meeting them and talking about even potentially other species and issues they might be having in germination but no I haven't in Australia or not at this stage. Mm -hmm. I was thinking more of overseas or anywhere. There's talk about going to South America <laughs> for security which would be very exciting. Mm. Yeah. But, I mean, we did find out some interesting things, but it's, it's hard to show exactly how it applies at the moment because of the way the industry's gone. It's a bit disappointing yeah. yes. uh, with the collapse of forestry, but I think we made some good findings. And yeah, we, we did, yeah, made some good findings, I think. Richie, right. is it um, true that you offered a uh, certain person who helped out? A lobster dinner? <laughs> <laughs> There's been a bit of speculation about lobster for a while, but I can't confirm that. There was only one certain person in the room for that. Right. So that person was Jude. <laughs> I think that was Sean Cedar. But he's long gone. Okay, well, anyway, if there's no more questions, I'd like to thank both speakers very much for excellent talks.